Hi, welcome to Drupal Camp Asheville. Um, hopefully you're all awake for this morning. Um, my presentation is about making site building easier through contribution. Um, the general idea uh, that I want to talk about is simplifying the site building experience, the development of modules, and improvement of the, the user experience and the modules that we have now. I am Rich Gerdes. I uh, work for a company called Unleash Technologies. Um, and I'm Rich, my, Rich Gerdes on Drupal.org, and there's my website. And up in the top corner here, if you do want to look at the presentation, um, the slides are available on my website. That link, it is case sensitive, unfortunately, because Linux servers, but it is available there. One of the big things that I do um, is contribute modules. Um, here's a small list, um, some of the projects that I've contributed. Um, OpenAPI and Samata are probably the biggest well-known platforms. I've done work with web forms, um, some integrations, and access control projects as well. Um, I feel like contribution is a big part of the community, and when working on something, you know, if I can build it in a way that can be contributed um, to give back to the community, that's that's my preference to do that that way. Um, I think one of the big things that we're looking at um, as we move into you know the next year or so is uh, looking at the Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 upgrade process, especially since if you were in a DrupalCon Pittsburgh, they announced the Drupal 7 end of life being uh, January 5th, 2025. Um, so just over 18 months, or just under 18 months from now, um, you know, hopefully we won't have any Drupal 7 sites uh, remaining. But if you, I don't know if you've looked at the statistics um, on Drupal.org, but um, if you have, you're probably familiar with this graph, um, which shows the trend um, of installations and Drupal 7 is going down. Um, we all know that. Um, to take a look at some numbers, um, in 2018 um, was a peak number of installs of Drupal. Um, you'll see that we had just over a million uh, Drupal 7 installs, still a handful of Drupal 6 installs, um, and about a quarter million um, Drupal 8 installs. And if you fast forward to today, you'll see that the Drupal 7 installs have dropped off significantly. We're only um, just under 400,000. Um, the April uh, 2018 peak here is coinciding with two major security releases. I'm not sure if you all remember those, but you probably do, um, which is why those numbers are a little higher inflated on the graph. Um, you can see that little peak um, sort of in the center. Um, and as you look forward, you can see that Drupal 7 installs have gone down, but those sites haven't been upgraded to Drupal 8. Um, they're moving out, uh, you know, out of the Drupal space. And the question is why, um, you know, and You'll see that yeah, we haven't grown. We still have, we've dropped off by um, almost half the number of sites. Um, so to me, you know, looking at that graph, I wanna know why Drupal isn't growing. And I think there's been a lot of software, uh, platforms as services that have come up. Um, the cost of development um, is there. And the big question is, you know, how do you make Drupal more accessible, more usable, um, easier and cheaper? And through my organization, I work for an agency, and these technologies is an agency, and uh, oftentimes we lose out on bids because our bids come in too high. Um, and so the big question is how do you bring down the cost of building and maintaining Drupal projects, right? How do you take a client's small budget and make that, stretch that budget out? Um, and I think contributing uh, modules is one way to do that. Building better products, um, you know, building better out of the box functionality. Um, so things that we've identified, um, oftentimes when starting a new project, themes need to be built from the ground up. Certain modules don't come with default configuration or aren't compatible with other uh, modules and extensions. Um, so that's the major thing. The other piece is hiring developers. Um, it, sometimes it's a challenge. Uh, my organization has struggled to find like junior developers. We have a large senior developer staff, a lot of Drupal experience, but don't have a lot of junior members. And when we have them, it's hard to find for us to find work for them because of the complexity of some projects and needing to understand Twig and JavaScript and CSS and all these things to build a front end, but also understanding complex PHP backends. And we work with a lot of associations, so integrations are also a big piece. And when you put all that together, it's hard for us to, to hire developers. Um, so I think the Drupal learning curve, um, you know, puts us, because it's so complicated, so unique of a platform, um, you know, it's not appealing necessarily to developers who want to get started with a React application or something, um, a new technology that they're learning about in, in school, um, but also the complexity required to develop the app, uh, build it and start a new project, makes it hard for, for someone to get started. 
So the big question is, how do you grow Drupal? Um, and I think for me, the, the easiest way to look at it is competitors. Um, so what other products are out there? Um, what is doing well? Uh, and I think our biggest similar product is WordPress. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with WordPress and what it does, but um, I think the highlight of the features is uh, their, their page building experience through Gutenberg. The integration with WordPress is really solid. It's really powerful. Um, the extensible plugin system, especially with the, the extension browser, the ability to search for plugins and themes and install them straight through the browser. Um, and then regularly refresh and develop uh, starter themes where you can install a fresh uh, identity on your site, especially a new site um, coming with a modern look and feel out of the box. And they also have e-commerce features through WooCommerce to similar to Drupal Commerce. Um, I think the main focus of WordPress, at least um, out of the box, is sites and brochure sites, simpler, simpler products. Um, and uh, I think one of the biggest things that sets WordPress away from Drupal is the fact that they have paid um, free, but also paid in, in premium uh, plugins and themes. And then WooCommerce is a great solution for simpler sites for getting commerce up and running. Um, and so when we talk about themes, you know, here's two of their the recent uh, Drupal themes or uh, WordPress themes that have come out. Um, looking at those labels are the same, but uh, the 2020 and 2023 um, themes, and you know, provides a modern look and feel. Um, and then uh, Gutenberg editor is a great editor, a lot of functionality there to build, you know, columns and all, everything. Um, a big step up from their uh, just standard editor, and then their plugin browser, the ability to find modules and themes, um, is core to to the WordPress platform. And uh, the big, the big challenge with WordPress is that, yes, it's free to, to set up a host, but if you aren't a developer, um, you can go pay for it. Um, here are some of the, the costs. Um, and I think you know, if you, you reach out to an agency and ask them to build a WordPress site, simpler WordPress starts at a few uh, like $1,000, $10,000, a reasonable expectation for building a, a basic or a medium-sized WordPress site. Um, oftentimes, Drupal comes in more expensive than that. Um, when compared to Drupal, I think Drupal excels the fact that we have a structured content system, uh, you know, ability, the field system, um, workflows for, for approving and drafting content, the views and, and data aggregation, um, our roles and permissions, the, the flexibility there is uh, much more granular. Um, and then our extensions focus more on integrations and, and advanced functionality where WordPress um, focuses more, I think, on data models, uh, you know, providing additional features, but not really on the usability of that data. Um, and I think Drupal's major thing is the free, uh, pretty much all of our modules are, are free, uh, where compared to WordPress, a lot of stuff um, you have to buy externally from WordPress.com. The other thing to look at is, you know, platforms as a service. Um, so I played around with Squarespace. Um, I've, I've worked a little bit with it before, but really think about how it compares and stacks up against Drupal. Um, I think one of the big things that Squarespace has is a number of options between out-of-the-box themes. Um, it comes with an extensive e-commerce system for handling orders, products, donations, uh, subscriptions can even be done through that, as well as point of sale um, for a small business who wants to run, you know, checkout in, in a storefront. Um, that can be done through the website as well. Uh, they have a pretty advanced layout builder, um, as well as CS SEO and marketing tools, um, including a CRM to handle email campaigns and analytics. Ultimately, Squarespace is a pretty intuitive experience out of the box. Uh, pretty much anyone can set up a site. You can pick your colors. Um, I think it took me about 15 minutes to basically go through and have a site up and running. I didn't do a ton with upload, updating images and updating text, but it was basically set up within less than 15 minutes. And their simple order and product management workflow, um, you know, it's really easy to add something and get it displayed on the website and take orders. Uh, without a ton of setup and configuration. Um, so here's an example of the interface. Um, it's pretty straightforward for changing the designs, handling commerce and pages, um, and accessing all the features. Pretty intuitive. Um, you know, the site out of the box is flexible. It's not a ton you can do easily with changing the layout of the site, but there's a lot of tools um, and functionality that's there. And I think one of the biggest takeaways I had was actually their um, layout page building experience, which is super interesting. It uses this neat 24 column layout. Um, and you're actually able to resize, um, drag and resize any one of these um, boxes and shrink it down uh, by a column or expand it by a column in a really neat way where 
you know, Drupal, if you have used Layout Builder, um, you have a six fixed width columns. It's kind of hard to change that. Um, and, and if you wanted to make this a four column layout, you just adjust the layout a little bit, um, which is, is super cool to, to see the flexibility there. Um, the main downside of Squarespace, I think, is the cost. Um, you know, there's no free option um, for to launch your site. You need to pay about $16 per month um, for a personal site. If you want to look at commerce features, um, that can get up to about $24. And if you're looking to for support building your website, it is pretty cheap. Um, you know, you can get a freelance developer to build you over, uh, help you configure Squarespace for you know less a few thousand dollars, um, getting you started pretty easily. Um, I think. When compared to Drupal, um, the advanced work, the users and permissions that we have is pretty powerful. Our uh, content workflows, um, especially our structured content as well, um, since their focus is mostly on pages and, and products, there's not a lot of fieldability there. And uh, our integration system, our extens extensions that are available um, are a big benefit. And the fact that you can self-host Drupal out of the box without needing to um, pay for you know hosting system if you already have infrastructure. Um, and you could host that somewhere else too if you have you know, data requirements, security requirements. And the, the third product I really analyzed was Contentful. Um, I took a look at this because we as the Drupal community um, were taking a look at API first um, with the addition of modules such as uh, JSON API into core. Um, you know, taking a look at how this compares to a product like Contentful, um, also a platform as a service. Uh, so uh, much like Drupal, Contentful has a pretty robust fieldable system, field system. Um, you're able to define complex data architecture um, properties and relationships between different types of entities. Uh, out of the box, it comes with an API system comparable to uh, JSON API. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration functionality letting you edit content along with team members. Um, and they do have some integrations in an extension marketplace where you can add on that functionality. Uh, ultimately, the main downside, I think, of something like Contentful when compared to Drupal is that it doesn't have a front end. Um, you have to go out and build your own front end uh, with a JavaScript app or something else to actually pull the data from Contentful or use it as a back end for a mobile application or just as a data service. Uh, and it can get pricey once you start scaling up to build a larger organization, adding users um, and some of the extensions, it can cost uh, you know, upwards, uh, you know, the, the pricing is not actually published. But it is free for personal use. If you have a basic application or a simple product, you can you know, have a couple of users collaborate together for free. Um, as you start expanding the project, um, it will, you know, their, their pricing starts at $300 per month. Um, and there's extra premium costs for things like adding teams, um, you know, scoping to be able to manage content, um, SEO if you have you know, a corporate authentication system. Um, as well as expanding that permission system to limit access to features. Um, all of that does cost extra with the platform. Um, costs aren't actually published on their website, but uh, they are there. So when you compare it to Drupal, out of the box, our roles and permissions are pretty strong. Um, we have a great extension library with integrations and a lot of custom functionality. Um, they do have an API, but they have nothing that really compares to views in the way that you can build a set of you know, aggregation of data that's reusable. Um, you know, everything would have to be a query to their API. Um, and there is no front end experience. You know, you do have to build that where Drupal comes with something, even if it's not the best, it is there out of the box. Um, so ultimately, if you look across the platforms where Drupal is leading, um, you know, I think our field system, our structured data model, um, content workflows, views is, you know, a huge feature of Drupal when compared to other products. Uh, our theming system um, with accessibility is a you know, we do try to do that out of the box as the Drupal platform. Um, JSON API is a pretty robust platform when compared against Contentful. It's got a lot of the same features. Uh, and then our, our roles, um, our open source mentality, and some of the translation integration features that we have make it you know, a pretty competitive platform. Um, the big problem is, um, as Dries said in the Dries note in uh, last year, in 2022 at Portland, Drupal is for ambitious site builders. You know, we are trying to make site building easier, right? That's sort of what the product's based on. And a lot of those features are really great backend features. A lot of things that we sell at are backend features, but don't make the front end experience better. Um, so the idea I want to talk about is building better, right? Building better functionality, building better improvements, making it easier for site builders to build a better site. Um, 
So one of those things to do is to improve integrations. Um, you know, this is something that I've seen as a, my agency does a lot of integrations uh, as a result of needing to integrate with CRM systems. Um, and every time we integrate with a different platform, we have to redo the implementation. Um, you know, if you take a, take a look at the way that JSON API handles manipulating data when you're, um, they have, they're called enhance, or field enhancers. Um, those plugins, the way they handle that, that's all custom code only applicable to JSON API. Um, same thing when you take a look at the Salesforce integration and the way it syncs data, it's completely custom. Um, we have feeds, which is another methodology for getting data, but you know, Salesforce and doesn't leverage feeds. HubSpot doesn't, le the HubSpot integration, which I maintain, doesn't leverage feeds. Um, unfortunately, I, if I had built it from scratch myself, I would have done that, but it was built on top. You know, I inherited the project um, when I needed it uh, for, for work. Um, and web forms uh, has a lot of advanced functionality, but it uses a separate field system um, from what Drupal core uses for rendering elements and that kind of functionality. And when you talk about the uh, web form handling system, that all is also its own, you know, custom mapping system for field data. Um, it doesn't really let you give you an option to manipulate the the data in transit from what's actually submitted into the form to what you actually send to the back end. Um, so. When it comes to integrations, you know, the idea of a standard uh, system for doing that um, that could let you manipulate field data from what an admin enters in the back end to actually what gets displayed on the front end of the site or, you know, in transit between, you know, when you're syncing data in from something, um, whether it's a CRM or syncing to a CRM, cleaning up or reorganizing stuff um, before it's actually sent off. Um, the second piece that I think is a big challenge that we suffer from is theming. Um, and this one compared to WordPress and, and uh, Squarespace, those products come out of the box with a front end, um, a front end that's modern, it's easy to use, it's easy to customize. Drupal requires a lot of back end development in order to get there. Um, not necessarily back end, but you need a developer, a front end developer who knows Twig, who knows JavaScript, who knows CSS, who knows HTML, and in order to get a front end that's usable where these other products have you know, a, a usable front end. Claro is pretty, I love it, I like it, but I personally would never put Claro, I'm uh, sorry, Claro Olivero on a client site because it doesn't fit the client branding and the client's, you know, hooks. And, you know, we customize uh, Olivero, but out of the box, it doesn't fit the needs, um, you know, of most of my clients. Um, so the question there is, you know, you can't build the site without a front end with Drupal. Um, it's kind of core. Even if you're doing a headless application, you still need, you know, some front end experience. So, um, one of the proposals that I have, one of the efforts that I'm working on personally, is to develop ready to use themes. Um, you know, the ability to go and download a modern look and feel of your website, make it easy for dev shops or individuals to customize that with their branding and colors. Um, you know, this decreases the cost of development, upfront cost of building a site, um, as well as potentially makes it easier to maintain the site long term uh, if you can easily swap out your C theme or modernize a site by just upgrading or swapping the theme. Um, and it lets us focus more on the improvements to the site and the functionality of the site and less on getting it to, you know, the, a usable state. Uh, and I think this makes Drupal more accessible for non-developers. Um, it makes site builders easier for site builders to customize that, um, and you know, not just back, not just uh, developers, but also junior developers or people new to the Drupal community. The ability for them to get up and running without having to, you know, understand Twig and all the other technologies in order to get started with building a site. Um, it also lets us standardize and customize components. Um, you know, if you've used Layout Builder. I, I've implemented multiple times, you know, blocks to implement, you know, cards, uh, you know, certain widgets, you know, accordions if you're using Bootstrap, those kind of things as blocks within Layout Builder. And I feel like that should just come out of the box. Um, you know, these themes don't have to be in Drupal Core, but can live in Contrib, um, which helps them evolve and lets us introduce new versions as we go. And when we talk about themes, I think the biggest question is Layout Builder. And, um, Layout Builder, to me, as it exists in Drupal Core right now, is a front-end technology. It's meant for front-end devs. It's meant to be usable by end users. But it's built by a back-end developer. We know what it's capable of. We know how to use it. It was designed by back-end devs. And I don't think it's really front-end accessible. Um, and I think this came up this year at DrupalCon um, with, and during Dries' presentation uh, of Pitchburg. 
Um, for those of you who don't know, this was like Shark, Shark Tank. Um, Dries, along with some other uh, company donors, some sponsors of the project, offered to fund um, initiatives. Uh, Amy June, uh, one of the camp organizers, uh, actually benefited from this program with an initiative to help grow the, commu the Drupal community, providing uh, training resources. But two of the big pre uh, projects that were backed um, where one was an initiative to rewrite Layout Builder using React um, with the goal of making it more uh, responsive, more usable um, on a front-end perspective, um, as well as and their second initiative was uh, to look at Gutenberg and trying to make Gutenberg's integration with Drupal uh, stronger. Um, in this case, the focus was to actually col collaborate with the, the WordPress developers to actually understand how to use Gutenberg in the best way and how to integrate it with Drupal better to take advantage of some of the, the Drupal, core Drupal functionality. Um, and I think the thing about these two projects is they don't, but to me the biggest problem is not the interface, it's really uh, the features and functionality of Drupal, or of Layout Builder um, as it exists by default. Um, so I think the biggest thing is there's a lack of styling features. You know, you can place blocks, but there's no functionality around colorizing them or styling them. Um, layouts are fairly strict, unlike uh, Squarespace. It's hard to change the columns and resize layouts. Um, you know, there's no standard blocks um, by default. You know, you don't have a card block. You don't have standard, uh, you know, UI components in either theming layers or in modules. Um, you can install, uh, you know, WordPress or a Bootstrap extension that provides Bootstrap styling attributes to let you set padding and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't handle providing default elements. So out of the box, you don't, it doesn't come with a Bootstrap accordion or Bootstrap card interfaces. And these are things that we can add to the sites to make it more usable for our front end devs or our site builders without having to do more development. And you know, we can build it once as contrib, and you know, build on top of that. Um, so I think that's a challenge that we can, you know, take take forward. And, and building better themes that have the styling out of the box implemented, I think, is a, a big advantage. Um, so these are all my perspectives, and I think the biggest challenge that I suffer from is I don't know what other people are dealing with. Um, I tried to, my original topic for this presentation focused on understanding what other people were dealing with and the challenges of why people weren't succeeding at that. Um, so I had put together a survey. Um, if you want to take this survey, I appreciate it. I can send you the link directly afterwards um, if you want. Um, you don't have to scan it now. but. I want to know what other people are struggling with in the Drupal community, um, what are the biggest challenges we face, and to actually uh, solve those problems, um, you know, collaborate with people to solve that. If you can't do it because you don't have the experience or don't have the time, you know, how do we, how do we move forward on that and actually get that solved? Um, so it's a short survey. The main piece is your experience, understanding what kind of, you know, how, how you're connected to the Drupal community, what you're experienced in, and then ask some questions at the end about what you're struggling with, why you're struggling with that, what your sort of goals are, um, you know, and, and why you haven't solved that problem or if you even don't have an idea about how to solve that. Um, you know, so, so if you want to take some time and actually think about that, you know, it's, it's something that I think is, is kind of important um, to actually understand what we as a community are struggling with. And we do ask, I think, you know, the Drupal survey asks high level questions of what, what we're doing well and understanding what we are and aren't using, but I don't know if they're really, um, Pull in the community to understand the, the struggles in individual projects or individual teams. Um, so I'm hoping to hear some good feedback from you guys and you know, the larger Drupal community eventually um, and understand really what we can do to improve the experience the most. Um, so that's pretty much um, all I had prepared to talk about. Um, do you have any questions or thoughts in the back? I didn't see anything with regard to the backdrop. Have you looked into that at all? Um, you I have. Do what their run rate is right now? As far as like users or the yeah, yeah. Um, sites? I don't know the number of sites. Um, I have looked at Backdrop. Um, when it compares to, it, Backdrop um, aligns very closely with the Drupal 7 features. They do provide an, um, some of the Drupal 8 features like config management. Um, the upgrade process from Drupal 7 to Backdrop is actually pretty straightforward. It does require some development experience and understanding of the, you know, the platform. Um, 
but it's definitely an option for Drupal 7 sites. And I think you know the, the big thing which I left out of the presentation now that I'm thinking about it was talking about how do we get Drupal 7 users onto Drupal 8 instead of having them move to these other product projects, whether it's Backdrop. Um, you know, we, we do as a community, I think, support Brat Backdrop, but you know, how do we keep them on Drupal as opposed to them moving to WordPress or moving to a site builder? Um, and you know, I think Backdrop's a great opportunity, um, and I think if you are familiar with it, it's pretty easy to upgrade to it. Um, I think there was a talk that I went to here last year, um, if you check out the recording of that, um, which walks through that process. But yeah, I don't have actually stats on the adoption rate of it. Um, I had looked into that at one point, but I don't remember the numbers. So I think one of the other things, if you don't have any other questions, um, is that if you do have ideas about what, how you want to improve your site or things you're struggling with, um, and you want help solving those problems, I'm willing to, to help mentor or help you know, provide technical experience to, to help get those things fixed. Um, but I'm curious what people are dealing with. Well, I just had a question about your... Yeah. Um, in your evaluation of WordPress and like the, the uh, I guess the, uh, the plugin page where you can add plugins, in your experience, have you seen like implications of putting that kind of power in the client's hands and just being able to add whatever plugin they wanted? And I guess with that said, like looking at Drupal's, you know, coming of uh, adding extensions the same, same way, you know, like do, do we perceive implications of clients being able to potentially just, you know, hey, I want this, I want my site to do this feature, you know, and they go and and try to download something. Yeah, um, I have absolutely seen that in Drupal. Um, I have a client right now, and they're like, oh, we want to install this module. How do we get that installed? And you know, they have a developer that works with them, like, oh, how do we get this module installed? And getting the developer, we use Composer to manage dependencies and you know, deployments. We have auto-deployments set up for our projects, and you know, if they just go and install a module, it doesn't get committed to Git. <laughs> like, it's, so um, you know, I think when it comes to Drupal sites, I think the, the big advantage of something like a plugin explorer is uh, enabling potentially, you know, less experienced developers. Um, you know, you could have a front end or a, a junior dev find and install a module, run one git or ex, you know, that uh, with the Drupal um, project browser, their plan and implementation actually manages Composer. So it actually will go and update the Composer lock file, require the dependency put in the right location through Composer and not you know, through code. Um, so that means that, you know, a junior dev can actually go install a module without having to understand Composer. Um, you know, I think the when it comes to clients, um, you know, it's a gray area of do we really want clients doing that? Can they break sites? Um, that kind of stuff. And I think um, when you talk about a client that an agency supports, I probably would not give them access to that page via, via roles and permissions. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, providing a platform as a service um, or, you know, uh, WordPress has WordPress.com, you can go and install a plugin straight through WordPress.com and it just works. And if we as a Drupal community wanted to support clients like that, smaller organizations that can build and produce their own sites um, without needing an agency or needing, you know, technical support for that, I think having a project browser is key to making that work. Um, so I think there's some balance there. Um, right now, the major hosting providers, if you use Acquia, Pantheon, um, they don't actually have a good way to use that. Um, you know, Pan uh, Acquia doesn't actually let you modify the file system, either does Pantheon, so you can't actually download, install, and upload a project or an extension to Drupal, um, which is an interesting question about how the hosting services will adapt to accommodate that. But I think, you know, um, depending on the organization, it could be beneficial, it could be something that you know, if you're, you're, say, a large university providing 100 sites, it's easy for you to go into production and add a, add a module to a particular site, probably over, you need to do it locally, committing it, pushing it, deploying it. Um, and I think that depends on the organization and who the client is and who the supporting team is. Follow up? <laughs> Nothing? No, no, I, I just, uh, it's a lot it, to think it, about. It's interesting, it's like, you know, this commitment to, um, you know, providing that option, I guess. But it's, it's like thinking of 
the stability of a lot of modules out there, and the, not only and the complexity behind them. It's kind of like it's like giving this this tool, but you know you really need to have uh, yeah kind of a, a stronger like foundation with with modules and like making them more user friendly. Like some things you just enable, you're like. Well, and that's no, no clue yeah. what, what to do next. Yeah, and I think that's sort of one of the big things about the presentation. Uh, the, what I want to drive home is that it doesn't. It's not the ability to install modules. It's the ability to use them. And you know, if I can't feel confident that my users can install a field module and configure the field and correctly and make it display correctly, then I don't trust the users to do that mod, like to use the, the browser and add those modules. So I think there's a balance there for sure about skill level, but I have clients that are familiar with Drupal and it's like they want to add fields and they want to configure stuff and it's like our workflow doesn't support that. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so what did you say? I was talking yesterday about um, like site builders and the conversation was around like should they be actually adding modules and like actually trying to configure those modules and I was like, oh my god, I cannot imagine the people on my team going and being like let me make sure that this is supported by the version we're on and let me actually go through and understand Composer and the command line. And so, like, I wonder if you would actually, like, I don't know how everybody else's companies work, but would you trust somebody to go through and, like, find a module? And, like, I personally wouldn't. Like, I love my team, but <laughs> it, yeah. I don't know. There's just such a big difference there. Yeah, um, for the recording, the, question, the comment was about the complexity of installing a module right now and making sure that module is compatible. Um, and I think something like a project browser actually assists with that, right? Because, you know, we can program into it. If it's not compatible with the version of Drupal core, don't let you click the install button. But otherwise, you know, right now it's like, oh, I go just run the composer command. Why didn't it work? <laughs> Question so back. I'm, I'm on the project browser committee, the site building committee. Of okay. And I've been involved since it got started. And this has been a big discussion for us on how we go about doing this and keeping everyone safe at the same time. And I think that's that's a key thing to understand that just because we have that tool coming out and it's being worked on, not all the workflow around it, full disclaimer, not all the workflow around it is uh, you know, in a state that you can give it to a client. So what we've done at our operation at work is uh, we've installed Project Browser in the dev instance uh, on our sites with uh, config sync. And so that's there, it's available for us to use and show our clients what options are. And that the default filtering is for being game only modules and security supported modules. So that kind of lowers the bar if people stay within the within the confines of that uh, filter. But you can also turn that filter off. But we're using it more as a development tool uh, and a tool for educating our clients to, more than anything else right now. And you're gonna have to wait until some other things get nailed down. But there will be support for Git and you know those types of things so that you can uh, so that you can have this happen on a site. But again, like you say, the hosting companies that are out there right now, the premier hosting companies, are not supporting this either right now. So it's a it's a working process for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely a complex yeah. topic for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, for the recording, um, one of the project browser team members um, was talking about the challenges that they face, and. Uh, what they're doing to try to combat things like security and usability of the project browser to prevent issues with the sites and some of the uh, restrictions that they put on um, implementing that within their team, such as only doing it in development so that you can't actually use it on production, um, but there are plans in the project to support uh, Git and committing those changes and you know, managing it through Composer, which will help the development process in the long term. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Does Project Browser like read like a README file that's in a module to kind of or not guess, right now? Not no. right now. No, not right now. I think I'm curious, like how with WordPress plugins. I mean, I guess it's been a long time since I've added them, but 
Or like sometimes they come with doc, you know, pretty decent documentation like that you're yeah. kind of reading right then and there. Yeah, I think the plan, if I remember correctly, is that that data is pulled from Drupal Arms API or will be pulled from the API and that's populated from the modules page on Drupal.org. Okay. Um, so you can put an icon, you can actually upload, if you've maintained modules, upload an icon for your module into Drupal.org now that would show up in the project browser. And then if you fill out the summary for the body field on the, the node on her, yeah, node on Drupal.org, that would populate what shows up in the project browser. So yeah, you can, We I think there is a plan to fill the documentation in um, to an extent through that. So that's usually where all the like the developer code the site builder information is, whereas like the module page is just kind of like, you know, this is why you want to pick me kind of thing. Yeah, I think there's a balance there about documenting both of those things. Um, and like yeah, the README often has technical like instructions that might not be relevant to site builders, but you know, how do you how do you provide all that information? It's a good question. There's a, there's a lot of work going on right now with regard to categorization of modules too, right now. If we took all the modules, I think there are 54 categories that are out there, which are really kind of, that's a, that's a ridiculous number of categories for modules for anybody to get any real use out of that. So we're trying to pare that down to like 17, I think. Uh, right now, so there's a there's an issue out there that anyone's ever, anyone who's interested, you can hop on the project browser project dash browser channel on Drupal.org Slack and uh, ask a question of the team or uh, join us in our weekly meetings. Tuesday afternoons we're meeting the site builder committee, and then Wednesday mornings we're meeting uh, with the development group and. Uh, so we're trying to pare those things down, but if you think about 50,000 some odd modules out there, not all of them are going to be ready for your site. So first of all, filters, filters based on the, the version of Drupal you're on, and then the, the, secure, the secure supported and maintained modules are the next two things that are kind of in the list if you're looking for something. And search is not all the way there yet, but we'll search. Uh, eventually on uh, the full project description. Mm -hmm. And um, there's gonna be some other things coming into, coming into play as well. So it's very much a work in process. So encourage a lot of participation and throw your ideas back at us. Yeah. If you've got questions on those kinds of things, certainly we're open and, and interested in those. Because we can't do, none of us can do this in a vacuum and we've got 50,000 modules and the maintainers for those to bring along, <laughs> and that's going to take a while. <laughs> yeah. so. and in case the recording didn't pick, pick that up, um, if you are interested in helping with Project Browser, getting questions answered about it, um, there's a support channel of Project Browser on Drupal Slack and weekly meetings for, yeah, weekly. and those are others are in Slack as well, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so they're async in Slack. Yeah. Slack. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Slack meetings for for checking in on, on statuses and updates. And the, if you want to work on the project, um, one of the current initiatives is developing the categories or re redefining the categories for Drupal modules um, that'll be used by Project Browser. And there's an issue on Drupal.org for that. I assume in the Project Browser issue queue, right? Yep, yeah. there's lots of issues out there. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I'm curious how everyone got into contributing to other projects. I have only worked on the one site that I've been involved on, and I think there's always like that huge barrier of like, am I, you know, the imposter syndrome of like, am I good enough to like actually help in this, and like, what can I actually bring to the table, and am I going to seem like an idiot? <laughs> and there's just like, for me personally, just like such a big barrier to actually getting involved in things like that. So I'm curious how you guys all got there. It is very. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the question was about. Amy would not agree to that. Yeah. Amy <laughs> June, she's she's one that has been more work. Uh, she's not a developer, and uh, through technical documentation, uh, there is a contribution page on Drupal.org. You can go there. It, it and and then just go through some of the the cues, right? Uh, which is about not just about development, but about technical documentation. You can start with that at least. Uh, if you are into development, then nothing like it. Like, just pick up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, if not, then yeah, like 
talk yeah. to ABU. And I, I, I don't think that there will be anybody better uh, who's non-developer, uh, and, and she will tell you how to win that award. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. definitely a barrier that you can overcome. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, it, I struggled a lot with um, understanding how to submit a patch. And also the process is behind, um, you know, just, uh, well, even from a code perspective, like understand, making sure I knew what I was like suggesting as a, as an option. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like a barrier, but once you get practice with it, you're like, okay, it's, yeah. this is easy. And it's actually kind of fun to find bugs and things because you feel like you're actually solving problems not for your company, but for you know for everyone else. And um, I do get some joy out of that. Even if it's small. Yeah. Uh, the question that was raised is how to get involved with contrib contribution and, and to sort of break through the, the barrier on that. Um, and suggestions were to talk to Amy June, um, who works on mentoring contribution, um, the workshop for that, um, which her resources are available, I think, to all camps and at DrupalCon through the training. So if you can make it to that training during an event, um, it's a great opportunity. Um, but I think, yeah, getting in Drupal Slack and saying, hey, I want to help with something that's an easy easy thing to start with um, I think most there are lots of people who will say oh help you have you to review code or, or give you feedback on that um, you know I'm I think almost everyone in the community is willing to, to help and I think if you run into an issue opening an issue you know asking how you can help solve that issue um, most module maintainers will accept feedback if they're active and help with that to add to that, like one of the, as you mentioned as well, the fear, right? Like that fear needs to be dropped. One thing that you need to know, community is beautiful, nobody judges. So keep that in mind. Whenever something tells you, you know, which holds you back, that fear, fight that by saying that no, there are kinds of people out there. Some you know, you'll always find some stupid people around, but you want to ignore them. You just want to be focused towards what you really want to do. And contribution will only Take your career much, much ahead. Uh, very honestly, that's, that's my yeah. take to it. Yeah, I uh, think I think the big thing is just you know even if there's something it's like you want to come up, you have an idea and don't have the experience for that. Saying to the community, I want to do this thing. Who can help me? Um, people will step up and, and do that. Um, you know, I think when it comes to getting involved with contribution, I got involved with contribution because you know I found a bug on something and submitted a patch because I have the as a back end dev I had the experience to figure that out. But also, um, I convinced my team um, at my former job to support me in publishing projects that we'd worked on. So we'd built extensions and being able to publish those um, and making those available. And through that, um, getting connections, you know, I, I took over and worked on Open API with Ted Bowman, and he was like, "Yeah, I'll make sure you know you your first couple commits, help you review them, and you know." So there's plenty of people there that will help help mentor you if you want to want to be involved with that. Um, I think yes. Yeah, the, the question is, how do you how do you get started? And then once you're started, I think you know it's very clear. And, and you know, the back before Git, the days of creating patches, that was not intuitive <laughs> to get started with. Um, I think it's a little bit easier now that we have GitLab. Um, but yeah, documentation is a great place to start. Um, you know, just filing a bug report is contribution, even if you don't know how to fix it. Okay, I think we're just about at time. Um, unless there's any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, thanks for coming. Thank